we need teams, don't we? We need them for communities that come together and support It never comes down to just one thing. Welcome to this episode of Finding Your Range podcast with me, Julie Debon. This is the podcast which delves deep into hypermobility, EDS and chronic pain. And we're joined today by Jane Green. I'm really excited to chat with her. We're going to hear all about her in a second. Um, but just wanted to say welcome, Jane, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. So let me read you her bio and then we'll get started. And um, find out what Jane has been up to recently. It's really exciting what she's been involved in. So in June 2018, Jane founded SEDS, which is Sussex EDS. And this was designed to increase local specialized support and improve awareness, knowledge and understanding of EDS and HSD and co-occurring conditions, plus to advocate in key areas of health, social care, education and transport accessibility accessibility locally. That's a tricky word to say. Previously, she taught at St. Piers Special Epilepsy and Autism School. She was an advisory autism teacher at a local authority, lead educationalist at NAS, which Jane will tell us what that is, and helped design and lead the AET training. Plus, she was an assistant head teacher. Unfortunately, her health declined. And after being labeled bendy, she was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, stopping her career in 2015. She then received a diagnosis of EDS3, which we now call HEDS, of course, um, but she was immediately discharged as there was no defined treatment protocol back then. So currently, Jane champions symptomatic hypermobility and autism health on various health and research organizations education and social care groups and air transport forums. She led the first UK school toolkit for symptomatic hypermobility and co-occurrences in EDS and JH, JHS for primary and secondary schools, which has already traveled overseas in 2021. That's amazing. And recently she submitted her first manuscript. Oh, I didn't know that. I look forward to hearing what that's all about. So again, welcome, Jane. Lovely to have you. Um, and what a fantastic um, introduction there. You've, you've been involved in so many things and uh, we're going to delve deep into that, um, if that's OK. Now, so we've heard a little bit there about your journey. Could you tell us a little bit more about your own journey? Because it sounds like many people that I meet, um, you had a blossoming career. Um, a very valuable career, but it was interrupted by this condition. Um, could you tell us um, what happened? Um, yes, it, it was blossoming in a way. Um, it was quite a late career for me. And um, because I had to study late because of um, I had children and I had no qualifications when I was younger. Um, and my passion was to find out how to help my eldest and I needed to do psychology because we kept being blamed and um, and there was a lot of stigma and so I studied psychology and then um, I just carried on studying and won awards and I realised, although it still affects me sometimes, um, that I'm not actually dim which is what I was labelled as when I was younger and um, I think so I started quite late and then I had to be an educational psychologist was my thought and that was my aim when you sort of aim for it. But um, I did my PGCE uh, secondary training uh, down here in Sussex and to, you had to be a teacher to um, be a educational psychologist. But the very years training, um, they changed it to the doctorate and you didn't have to be a teacher anymore. So, but nevertheless, it was really good training. And I'd worked in schools, gosh, I mean, since the children were little, um, because we kept being expelled, <laughs> and excluded. <laughs> even from nursery school, even from nursery school, we were excluded. And um, it was just 
I, I don't talk about this too much with my elders publicly, but we had a pretty horrendous journey schooling. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's what I wanted to help others for. And mm -hmm. I know much more now, of course. Yes. Um, well, that makes yeah. sense now. Yes. Why you got so involved in the school toolkit then. Oh, absolutely. I mean, your personal experiences, which always makes the best work, doesn't it? When you're bringing your heart into it. Well, you know, I've worked with um, autistic pupils for a long time and ever back in the 90s. I think uh, without doubt, motivation is key uh, and it overcomes a lot of issues, a lot of issues. Um, yes. So for me, uh, that was my passion, but I was, I was, my um, illnesses and injuries just accumulated and um, I was never, it was never explained to me. I never had physio, I never had any sort of, um, sort of maintenance, keep fit things going on. I, I was very sporty. I loved dancing. I didn't, I never had dancing lessons. So mm -hmm. I had no technique, but I just dance and um, I used to do a lot of sort of, Latin and um, jitterbug and jive and things like that. Lovely. Um, I used to perform. I really embarrassed my youngest once turning up in school. Um, but uh, yeah, so I and I was very sporty. And of course, doing the sports I did um, were not the best, like badminton league, because you, you you're on your knees. I mean, really, mm. and and um, tennis and riding and running and yeah not not great impact sports and and I really enjoyed them but it wasn't I didn't know how to um support my joints mm. so they increased and I had operations and I would because if someone says you'll recover in two weeks I presume I will or yes. I'm very literal yes it's gonna blow my nose oh, no. go ahead <laughs> yeah well you know we tend to, we're gonna believe what we're told right and and I guess like you say, there wasn't a lot of information around. Um, you had no physio, no support. Um, so, yeah. No, and all the internal um, issues as well and rashes and things like that and increasing tiredness. You get that as a teacher anyway. Um, I was really proud to be um, doing my P2CE and I did the first um, lesson for my, my colleagues um, in autism, SEND which is special educational needs, uh, because there was nothing in those days at all in the whole year on special education. And they were really, really delighted with that. And I thought I actually have an advantage here because I've been working in this area for so long. You know, I was even an assistant cub leader once, um, which is quite funny because I can't tie knots um, <laughs> and I can't navigate. I'm quite... Um, it's quite well known. I get lost in the building after a minute. Yes. Oh, yes. I, I totally get that. Absolutely. Oh, oh I, I like to link up. So I'd be given all these children, um, particularly special needs ones, you know, you sort of conglomerate. And um, they'd tell me, no, you've got to give them this task to do and you find your way back and you give them this map. And I thought, I, I'm never going to do this. Um, but it, and in a way, it helped me teach because I would say, now, who can tell me the best way to get back? You show me. Yes. You, you yeah, show yeah. me how you can tie this bow knot. Or yes. Whether or not it was. Perfect. Yeah. That's very good. Um, so, so we spent a lot of time in the woods. Yeah. So when your career came to an end, which, you know, sounds like you can tell you absolutely loved doing what you were doing. Um, so between 2015 and 2018, when you started um, SEDS, Sussex EDS, what were you doing during those years and, and what then triggered your idea to start SEDS? Um, so, yes, I, I had to medically retire in 2015. By then, mm -hmm. I'd worked for the um, NAS, which was the National Autistic Society. So ah, I was an okay. educationalist there for autism. Yes. Nationally, yes. I, I did the professional conferences um, and I steered and helped design the Autism Education Trust, which is the um, social model of autism, because very much um, it's always been the medical model. When I was an advisory teacher, it was always the medical model and the language and the, the, the sort of 
perspective. Sometimes I, I felt very uncomfortable, but I, I was a very small minion there. And um, so I was really pleased to do the social model and uh, it was very, very successful. But I, I wasn't very good at keeping my job um, because of the showing. I was very successful, actually, but I just didn't show it off, um, which has been a big learning thing for me. But I kept being made because I didn't, you know, do all the networking really well and um I didn't see the point <laughs> I just thought my work will show it um I got made redundant then I I worked for another group just doing the autism social model of education because I thought it was important and strategic head but again mm -hmm. I had so many injuries I had to retire um mm -hmm. there was no question about that I simply couldn't move and I was yes. completely burnt out mentally and yes. um so 2015 I spent most of the year um, quite ill on drugs um, and finally got my diagnosis but then discharged like a lot of people nothing which I couldn't yes. believe I couldn't believe that was the case and yes. I bought the book that that well-known book the hypermobility book for my doctor uh, yes. and I thought I can't believe I have to buy this I had no money coming in um, now for my doctor because we still can't get anything and I had seven consultants and um I started volunteering for the national charity EDS UK and, um, and, and that only just started about a year later. So I think it was 2016 mm -hmm. and I was very much bed bound anyway. And um, I also went for another diagnosis that year, um, my autism one, which I yes. knew I, I had known. I just wasn't allowed to be autistic before. And um, I think, I was still, I was still completely burnt out. I didn't want to do much and mm. get involved, but a, a couple of things came up, which sort of were catalysts, I suppose, and um, and and made me thought, well, this isn't right. This is your motivation usually, and I thought, and then I'm hearing lots and lots of the same stories from suddenly all these people. I didn't do social media. I I never had time because I had children. I had to try yes. to you know get money in and work. And I was getting up at five and coming back late because I'd have to be in London or traveling or something. Um, so I never had time and I was always tired anyway. And I think um, I've lost my train of thought. No, don't, don't worry, Karen, you're doing oh, brilliantly. Um, I've forgotten where I am. Oh yeah, so I I just felt that um, social media, I didn't, I learned to do Facebook and then Later on, I did Twitter with SEDS, but I call yeah. it SEDS, by the way. It's easier. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Easy. But it's yeah. up to you. I mean, it's not, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I, I was ill and then um, I got even more ill, if you like, and um, I couldn't eat or anything. And with mass cell, probably, I haven't got yes. done it, but probably. Um, yes. But I, I think the, the key thing for me was not knowing. Um, yeah. We like to have control. And 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 it's it's empowerment. I mean, you should have facts. And if we don't know the facts, and no one knows the facts, it's it's really discombobulating, is my word. Yes. Um, but I was Absolutely. very ill. Yeah, I was very ill, and um, and and scared of food because I didn't know what was going to happen the next time mm. I took them. And, yes. and and the worst part for me was when my children, um, who were living both living with me still just didn't know what was happening I, I was, couldn't breathe I couldn't talk and no one believed me and all the tests came back negative you know that sort of thing mm. and um he asked me if I was dying and I simply didn't know I was just I thought how ill do I have wow. to get and go back to hospital and so uh, um but I did stabilize um there was bits and bobs and steroids and stuff but I don't know in it it comes back in flares I don't know why I, I stabilize and others don't um but I just thought and all the injuries that occur and I had some really bad injuries I can rupture tendons like that not even doing anything and no one believes me and you're discharged from A&E and &E. and I thought no I need something that's ongoing and on hands-on sometimes and yes. I'm sure what I'm hearing so I had the idea for quite a while that we needed ongoing support, local support. And the idea for SEDS was a local village group, um, like a coffee group in the village, yeah. supporting 
local members um, and getting local funds. That was the idea. I didn't realize <laughs> um, it would get quite so big, and which is great. And um, and that's what we do. And it and it's about actively supporting our members because yeah. unfortunately, and I support the NHS one hundred percent. And and it's always this sort of discussion discourse going on in my head. But we do need hands on. We do need more than three to six sessions in a block. And we do yeah. need more than one joint looks at because we all join up. Um, and 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 I I was didn't have the best um, perhaps um, support in, at times and disbelief. So, and you hear this over and over again from the members, and that trauma just just builds up. Yes. Right. And I I I recognise it because I've been there. And I yes. see a lot, but yeah. I think what SEDS wants to do is really empower people, uh, and we are, and yeah. and give back that you know that sense of motivation, that joy, because some of them obviously are very ill, yeah, and um, have lost a lot, um, and you lose you know your friends, your social thing, your employment, your money, and yeah. and you get a new set of friends, but you you're all living maybe. Well, we are living online, but definitely they were online. And then other people who, who want to carry on working and I want to support them as much as possible to carry on working. And that's really key because, mm. you know, it, it affects everybody. If you can't work, it's affecting the public purse. So yes. it's in all our benefits to carry on working, I believe, um, and being supported. So and then awareness, because in the public domain, um, it's not known about so you know and yeah. and I sit on various groups and organizations as you said I was a trustee a carer I have been a carer since my eldest was born I'm also sandwich carer now and uh so I'm very much pro carers um it's a non-ending job in a way but it's also a, a, a sort of passion you know yeah. um and carers come in all different stages you know everyone will be a carer at some point yeah. um yeah, and it's true. really it's really important i i believe it is a job as well as you know some people say oh no they're related to me it's you know if you were being paid for the hours you put in you know it, it's massive and it's never ending sometimes for some people yeah, and absolutely. and I think for that was key for the transport accessibility as well. Yeah. Which I got involved in. Wow. Amazing. You really look after your members. And I, I, as you say, it grew, didn't it? It's, you started off small, but now you have two amazing patrons um, on board. You have um, Dr. Jessica Eccles, who was also a guest last season on this podcast, um, and Dr. Tina Pierce, who... I'm very grateful to having a meeting with her, a consult with her a few years ago. And she definitely, if it wasn't for Tina Pears, I'd never have met Professor Kula, who basically was my savior. So I'm very grateful for Dr. Pears as well for pointing me in the right direction and understanding me. She was wonderful after, you know, as you say, lots of doctors just kind of go yeah. away. No, no. So very grateful to her, both lovely people you have there. So how do they get involved? What do they do for SEDS? Um, well, as you know, Dr. Eccles is um, a leading clinician and researcher in the world. So um, yeah. that goes by the by, obviously. And um, we, I sort of linked with her before, obviously being a patron um, in, in a couple of ways. So um, we had sort of talked about a couple of things to possibly work on and um so that had, that's sort of grown really and and we're local um and I also took part in um, a study on anxiety and intuition mm. with yes. um, a couple of other researchers so that all sort of links in as well I do like my linkings <laughs> and um, uh, that all links in and I so I'm still sort of helping there and vice versa. And uh, she, Dr. Eccles also gave, gave um, SEDS members an exclusive webinar and the chance to ask their own questions, which was great. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, so, yeah, and lots of ideas fling about because um, I have lots of ideas 
sometimes probably too many um <laughs> and uh, see where it goes but um also i have links to um because of sitting on boards and things uh which might be interesting and then um and obviously she has links to everybody as well and yes. the researchers so it's sort of yes it's very um i can't think of the word now um a serendipitous mm. relationship yes yeah yes. and then dr Piers again i think it, uh, she did a webinar in lockdown which was very useful and um covid had sort of been mentioned and started so uh, yes. we did a webinar there and again very useful because it explained my MCAS sort of reactions and and how I'd, I'd started trying to be healthy and having smoothies with you know, <laughs> Keith, yeah. which her, her daughter had. And I went, oh, well, that's probably why really the histamine hit and everything. Yes. And um, so, and that was key. And also uh, really interesting, um, I, I've had so many troubles with my operations and general anesthetics. And she explained it. Um, mm. And that's a really big relief to me. Yes. Um, and Absolutely. I think a lot of people found that useful. Yeah, it is, isn't it? When you find someone who actually understands what you're talking about, it takes so much of the stress away. It really does. Um, fantastic. So tell us about, I'm really interested in this, your school toolkit which you've said has tra already travelled overseas, which is amazing. This is, this is just outstanding. I mean, this is just amazing what you've helped create here. Tell yeah. us all about it. It's not mine. Um, but so I've been doing developing training, as I said, in autism and seen the pattern in yes. my pupils of various physical things, um, dyspraxia, not holding a pencil, particularly I worked mainly with boys because they were mainly diagnosed, but I did have a few girls. And um, I, I saw the same pattern, but I couldn't work it out what it was, you know, because I didn't know about it. But I designed training um, many, many times because I that was my job. I mean, that's what I did, not just the AAT, but all sorts. So while I was... Um, ruminating and sort of vegetating on my sofa for two years I thought I'll design some training keep my mind busy because otherwise it's not great and um so I designed it a sort of hypermobility thing but even when I was well enough I went into one of my local case schools actually and and ran it out I didn't tell them really much about it I, I just wanted a really good um honest reaction mm. And the Senko said, the special educational needs coordinator said yes. to me, oh, this is really, really interesting. Do you know, we have a lot of um, autistic children who demonstrate these things you're showing. And I went, oh, that's interesting. I know it, but yes, uh, not all, yeah. but quite a few. Yeah. And yes. um, it was shown to the teaching assistants, but, you know, I'm just one person, I get ill um, and I couldn't do it anymore. I don't have the reach. Um, luckily, with the EDS UK, um, they they found um, a fund and it took a while to get going. Um, but uh, we got it started and then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a nightmare um, because we had all these plans for team and and going into schools and getting videos and you know yeah. doing it all like that and um it, it was really quite difficult actually um because a we couldn't do that and b the team were very much stressed i mean they're teachers or teaching assistants or synchos and you know i just felt awful asking them in half term certainly couldn't do it evenings or weekends or or holidays can you just have a look at this? I'm, I'm writing it as best as I can, but <laughs> in your school, because it, yeah. it's really important to get the voice heard. So, yeah. I mean, it will need updating, but um, it did the best I could. And then, of course, I had, um, I had a serious uh, stomach operation last December, mm -hmm. and, and then we were in lockdown, and I couldn't get any help. And then I I hurt my shoulder, dislocated it again, but I actually tore everything. So I was trying to, and you couldn't get any support, but luckily I've got lovely um, 
a group in Crawley who put me back together each time osteopathy and so on. Fantastic. Um, and but I was trying to type, so I was, I'd have to lift my arm up to oh. do that, and it was agony, and it lasted for months. Um, so it was really, it wow. was so painful. It was literally painful <laughs> to do. Um, That's amazing that you kept you know, kept pushing through, you know, working on this project despite how you were feeling. The amount of messages I've had, and I, I expect the um, charities have had too, um, are heartbreaking. And, um, you know, they really affect me because I get these mums saying, um, this happened to me in school. And you can tell they're very traumatised by it. And they said, my daughter's there now and not being believed. And and at least this will stop stop mm. it. I, we hope um, yes. that it more has to happen and might do. But um, yes. you know, at least what you what you can do. And the teachers wanted it. This, I've had Cinco saying they're desperate for this. You know, to have something to hang up on. It's not yeah. mandatory. It's not legislation. Yes. Um, and then some groups in Europe were very keen to see it. Um, I don't know if they're using it. I I don't know uh, the. I suppose you can analyze it and then I did um I've been I did the live conference the first one since Covid in mm. Birmingham and again it's it's strange because I, I'm used to doing conferences and having a big name behind me like NAS or something um or AT but when you're talking about something that's quite novel it's it's very much a divide they either get it or they don't it's complete mm. Or they, yes. or they don't. Yeah. Uh, so, so for me, it's um, working out how to get the message across. I think, yes, in the right yeah. way. And and sometimes I I think they know they might know more than I, I expect them to know. And then I did a webinar in Australia of a lovely um, person called Paul McLeff. I think I'm really bad at pronunciation, and he was really keen on it and um so the australian education system is similar so yeah fantastic and amazing yeah, comments so oh well done yeah. and um so what if we talk about the school toolkit and the issues that children might be having at school what symptoms or signals should teachers on be on the lookout for for you know children who might be struggling at school what could we see i think um it obviously varies in children. I mean, if I think about myself, I didn't have many issues um, physically apart from mm. doing party tricks and joint tricks and being extra flexible and then um, some GI issues and migraine. But I think um, you know, seeing the children and looking back at the past, it would be definitely be things like um, tiredness, extreme tiredness. Um, particularly, maybe um, they seem very dizzy when they stand up um they 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 might not know they're in pain um i'm really interested in pain at the moment because um particularly for us because i'm autistic and i didn't realize that um i thought everybody feels pain like i do so i didn't realize it wasn't normal because i don't know what it's like it's like a motorway of pain you know it just goes on mm -hmm. being along and then you get the odd crash um yes. cuteness yes. and and maybe the odd flood <laughs> i'm doing an analogy here but um i think um they might not know pain because of the inner sense so you have eight senses and the interoception sense means mm. that you're not always aware if we've hot or cold or we're yeah. in pain or itchy and that was part of the study mm. I was in. and um, particularly for autistic children that means also they might not be able to express when they're in pain because they don't know how to articulate it yeah so yeah. all these things are like adding up and then suddenly it's overwhelming so it'll go from nothing and to absolute agony and and for the teaching assistant or a teacher they say where's that come from you know mm. the other thing that happens is obviously um a lot of children bruise so you get to two types basically i think i'm talking about hypermobility i yes. joint hypermobility yes. syndrome yeah not yeah. or yeah. other um 
you can get bruising out of the blue with these children and um, and obviously sprains and sometimes dislocations with children. And um, it, it's unexplained. So um, the teachers have a duty to ask where this is from. I, you know, we, we're trained to do that. And they ask the parent or carer, how did this happen? And they've got no idea. And actually to them, it's quite normal because they've been doing it all their lives, maybe. And, um, and then they say, well, why are they vomiting all the time? Why aren't they eating? Why are they so thin? Why are they tired? Why do they need a wheelchair when they've been walking? We're going to take their lift pass away. So these sort of things, you might see a child walking and running even, you know, that can happen. And the next hour they can't. They need to be believed. They might need a rest. Um, uh, they might get migraines suddenly, um, particularly bloating, you know, after eating or vomiting. And and often this is put down to um, a mental health disorder like um, uh, anorexia nervosa or some sort of sensory disorder like ARFID, which mm -hmm. um, is the most common sort of explanation, but actually it is physical. And um, I know because I went to it and uh, and so many of my members do, and I'm sure others feel that too. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the other thing I'd say is it all adds up. Um, there's not a lot of evidence, I don't think, for allergies, but I've sat on nice panels and so on. And the link between eczema, asthma, hay fever, um, and allergies and probably all like linked to MCAS and histamine is huge. Yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely look at that. And then obviously the, the much stronger emerging links that Dr. Eccles and, and probably some others are doing on between um, neurodivergence and um, hypermobility and anxiety. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and when I say, I talk about autism because that's my diagnosis, but, um, also ADHD and dyspraxia, and maybe some other dis, like dyscalculia, which I also have. Um, yes. And um, so I, I, I can't say much at this time of recording, but we, I've been working with another team. And so we don't know really if I can mm. say anything yet, but we have worked on a paper on pain and uh, um, okay. recommending, um, you know, basically I would say, if children have a diagnosis and usually it will be boys at mm. school age or primary age yeah. um, yes. that they are screened for hypermobility as well um, yeah. and vice versa yes. and, and the other key thing for me about the school toolkit is um, so many secondary age girls are missing school or mm. are too anxious to go back to school and this is called emotional based school avoidance and it's put down like that but i actually think a lot of it if you look at the symptoms they say these these pupils um exhibit or present with uh vomiting tiredness um bloating anxiety and i'm thinking are they looking at the whole picture here yeah. because we know we know that um people with postural tachycardia and um, you know, it sort of mimics anxiety. So yes. it's almost a bodily, physical yeah, yeah. anxiety. Absolutely. And um, it, so maybe the wrong approach is being used there. And that's why I hope the toolkit, which is evidence-based, um, but needs updating, will be uh, very useful there for teachers mm. and for parents, carers, yeah. and most of, all, most of all the children. I can't. Um, and I wrote um, some articles, oh, blogs, sorry, in 2020. Actually, it was my first blog, I think. And um, <laughs> for the Educational Psychology Group and um, a lovely chap. And I don't want to embarrass him now, um, but did say, what is hypermobility? <laughs> and I, I went, I think you need to let me write this article and publish it. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll find out. Oh. And it, it, it actually was the second most read blog that year behind COVID, which considering COVID was quite wow. large. Yes. Amazing. I know. So I, I, was, I, was, I was happy yeah. that it was out there, but a lot more needs to be done. And um, Absolutely. so we don't get yeah. that trauma growing up because I think children, um, 
having all these issues will be your adults with chronic illness growing up whereas there are if you had that support and management Mm. it could be so much more improved absolutely yeah oh well that's awesome work um so you've mentioned obviously your autism diagnosis um can you tell us about the work that you've done your advocacy work with autism um and what you're doing now um yes so uh i've been involved i'm always my masters i i was always interested in transformational change and i i focused on autism initiatives in educational establishments but um it's always been about a sort of strategy and seeing the bigger picture i suppose so that's what I like to do. And I can use my skills and experience that I've gathered over the years, because I'm quite old, um, to do this. Uh, and it does, you know, you can use that. It, the things that happen are not great. I mean, I've, I've really hit the wall a few times, but mm. um, learning to come, and I didn't like that word resilient, but maybe um, over time helps. Um, and my children have been really inspirational as well. I have to say that uh, they've been great, but I, I so I work um, as I said with a carers charity, and then I've been with the Social Care Institute of Excellence as um, the co-production board for many years, and with Nice they were combined, done a lot of guidances and all sorts, and mm-hmm. I sat on Nice panels, and and then I've been a trustee last year for them and i can't remember where else i am it's, it gets confusing uh i sit on the airport transport forum so i did the one at heathrow and it was right. in the yeah. uk magazine the first experience day yes uh, and i i talked about what you need to do what coding you need to do and so on Fantastic. and then the last three years at gatwick because and i opened it up because before it only been autistic children because that's all there were. Um, so I opened it up to adults and those with chronic illness and then disability. And then I opened it up to carers. I sort of say, you know, these guys, we need to be invited. You know, we, we it should be, I'm very much DEI, disability quality inclusiveness. Yes. Um, but of course with COVID that's, that's slightly um, stopped at the moment, sadly. Um, yeah. I, I'm policy lead with the, um, local uni medical university for autism health so I'll be doing talks to doctors the first UK training for doctors on autism health I sit on the Oliver McGowan mandatory training which is mandatory training for all health and social workers in England and Wales and I sit on the um, professional experience group and also the strategic oversight group and co-chair and this is really important because um, I'm also a parent, but it's really important to get the autistic voice on there mm-hmm. um, and, and get diversity on there. And, and it's important to have all that going. I know that I've been severely um, affected by not good practice for myself and also for my eldest, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am very motivated and then I see it happening again and again to my members so yeah and, and even with that stomach operation I had last year I, we went through all the the right drugs that might you know affect me and so on um, but once that's happened and it worked really well my recovery was bad because I didn't get IV fluids and I told the nurse um, I couldn't sit up and they said, oh, no, you'll be fine. I said, I can't. I will collapse. I've been doing this job 34 years. You'll be fine. They set me up and I collapsed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, what can I do? What can I say? You know, and of course, wow. I, I'm, I'm not very strong when I'm talking about myself in that situation. It's a medical situation. Of course. So. Yeah. Yes. Well, I feel very vulnerable, of course, in those situations. Yeah, I actually go mute. I, I can go mute. I know I talk a lot now, but I mean, when I was a child, I didn't talk. I couldn't talk on a phone. Certainly couldn't talk to people, like real people. Mm. Um, yes, I remember being a bit like that. And, you know, even my parents just teasing me about that. 
you know, mm. that I wouldn't speak up, you know, but that just so makes, that, makes the whole situation worse, right? Then you get even more self-conscious and you don't want to speak up anyway, so. Yeah, and I think this has been a key when I was training. I mean, I've trained people, autistic youngsters, um, to talk and they weren't mute. Um, and they appeared on television in 2017. Yeah, I was quite, quite big name, so... Um, you know, I was, I was quite proud of that. And, um, and and that's what I like to do is, mm. you know, Sid needs to empower us to yeah. to feel we, we are needed. We have um, value. And um, just because yeah, some people get a little stuck in situations, but um, they have such talents and like crafty yeah. things. I can't do that at all you know they they do crochet and mm. all these arty things I can't Absolutely. do um sorry where else do I sit um sorry I I've, I've lost the plot now I, don't, um, I honestly didn't realize how busy you were Jane you have so many hats on you're amazing I, I like to keep my mind busy but I am also get asked to do more and I do yeah. I can do it you see yeah and it's amazing. so I sit on um the National Institute for Health Research. And um, that's still evolving, but hopefully research from there will be really key. Um, and then, uh, gosh, I can't remember. Oh, round tables. And interestingly, Sid's cards from last year in COVID um, were put on the Department of Health and Social Care guidance. So they are actually sitting there because all the charities closed down and nobody could get cards to sort of for anxiety. You know, even if they had children, they can go shopping. Yeah, or they were like general ones or disabled ones or autistic ones. And, and um, a professional um, charity called the British Association of Social Workers wanted them for their workers as well. So I designed them. Um, so and that won awards during COVID. That was amazing. Quite interesting. Well and um, there are new things coming up all the time, uh, which I can't say at the moment. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> we we will wait and and hear in the future. Um, so you mentioned Dr. Eccles, and we obviously her work and other people's work about the relationship between um, neurodiversity, anxiety, hypermobility. Um, how is that affecting um, things now? I know you're going to talk about your professional experience and your maybe a bit of your personal experience, this, this whole relationship that's been uncovered. It's fairly new, isn't it, really? You mean the, the, the emerging autism. link between... Between autism yeah. and um, okay. hypermobility and anxiety, but mainly autism and hypermobility, I think, is... Um, yes, um, I... I think the anxiety for me, maybe because I don't recognise it very well, um, was al always an issue. And for me, having an autis autistic diagnosis, I always thought I'm not anxious at all. I don't present as anxious, but I'm a trained teacher and you have to do things, you know, you know, and that's like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that really helped me um, focus and plan. So my, my executive functioning really mm -hmm. improved. And I, I really believe that's a great thing. In fact, we've got a member now doing teacher training. She just messaged me. And she said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm going to, well, to embarrass her. She can't do it. Yes, she can. Oh. It'll be great planning anyway, even if you don't get there. I'm being observed. I can't do it today. I can't. You can. Just think what you can show off your skills. It went fabulous. <laughs> exactly. Oh. And um, so I'm really pleased. And she wants to do you know get into into that she's an aerial acrobat strange oh, wow. i know it's amazing um i forgot the question yeah just about your sort of what, what's your personal experience with this sort of autism and hypermobility link obviously you you can see it in yourself um and um you were what about your you mentioned your eldest um, so they're not a Lestanlos syndrome, um, but um, definitely lactone, which is what I notice in all the children I've worked with. So it's always put down to dyspraxia. Always. All our training had dyspraxia in. That was that was the cause of lack of tone. I used to say to occupational, because we had multidisciplinary teams. Mm. 
I was working in. And I used to say to the physios and the OTs and the salt, the speech and language, um, you know, various things like uh, why are they lacking in tone? Why are they all flopping? Why are they fidgeting? Why do they need this? What what's happening? What why is this? Why am I fidgeting now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and I was just like, and why why are they, we know they we some children spin, you know, like spinning things. Yeah, um, yeah. Particularly yeah. mine. And so my youngest got a diagnosis very young, um, and was very very ill uh, from birth. It was very difficult birth, sadly, and. Um, so there were so many medical issues, but actually got a in those days a diagnosis at two and a half, which was very young, and ADHD and dyspraxia. Um, but had so many allergies. But then you sort of left with nothing. And I think I waited two and a half years, and I had six speech language um, things. That the the best one I had was um, a friend's mother, and she taught me about intensive interaction which I um, grew to really um, like at St. Piers. And um, I like that sort of co-joining, mm. uh, co-playing and interacting uh, quite a lot. And for me, you know, my, so my eldest has had all the issues that are quite, um, you know, stereotypical, if you like. Uh, with sensory sensitivities and so on and allergies we've got very severe allergies here I mean my children one of them the youngest was, you know lucky to be here um, but the sound issues and the vision issues so all the senses were overloaded mm. and all the pain issues and and things like that but you know motivation is everything and I can tell you I went to um, when they were older we went to Germany and we went to a, a games conference thing mm. um, in, in Cologne uh, because he wanted to go. And I said, OK, I'll have to go with you. And um, it was this great big warehouse. And a lot of people were camping in tents, but I couldn't go camping anymore. I was too ill. But I walked in with them. And the sound was booming mm. and the lights were up there and the smell of these people camping, you know, it was overpowering because they've been there a week. And um, it was just like, oh, I can't bear wow. it. And I That's thought they would walk out and they said, I'm fine. You can leave me because <laughs> they say wanted to be there. Because oh, they were motivated. The Interesting. That's, yeah. Oh. So, uh, I've worked with so many people so, and and need, needle phobia. Um, my my eldest couldn't have needles for a long time because of the phobia or MMR or anything. Yes. But um, when motivated to have them for what they want to do, they could do. Mm. Amazing. So I've seen that so many times. Um, I I I mean I'm not a researcher. I don't know what the link is or why. I just have seen it. Um, the bendiness. I I I know. Um, I can see uh, things with people like the skin is quite obvious sometimes. Um, so there are two types of skin and that's probably the only benefit if you've got the thick skin is you don't show your rage so much and mm. you, you can go round your back and do an itch or something <laughs> if you don't dislocate your shoulder. Um, but I really... I, I, I don't know much about it. I think my role, I mean, Dr. Eccles does this key research. Um, my role, and we've talked about it, is to disseminate the information mm -hmm. um, in, in biteable chunks yes. you, and talk yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah. so I do very, it's really lovely now because when I was working for the local authority or whatever, organization you have to do it in set forms your powerpoints and your conferences and it's all very rigid as it has to be but now I can do my own it's like oh I'll do a little picture there and I'll do this there and I'll do color there and it's quite nice yeah. so that's what I do um but as I said it's 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 difficult trying to get the right information that will be accepted by the communities I think mm -hmm. and there are different communities and they all have different um, beliefs. Um, so it is quite 
challenging at times and and we have to be very um, careful and cognizant of history as well I think yeah, yeah absolutely oh thank you Jane for explaining that that's it's a very complex isn't it and like you say your ability to share that information in a way that your members can actually digest is probably very very powerful for them so um, I think it, having grassroots groups is very important um, yeah. and, and that is the way it's going yeah. anyway I know um, from government because um, we need to speak for ourselves we've had too many times yeah. not being um, allowed a voice and um, yeah so I mean said it's a voluntary group um, but we have we have a formal structure and um, we have some one a wonder I must say wonderful team uh, we've been a, uh, nearly a year we've been a kick social enterprise now oh so, amazing yeah. in fact Lovely. at the end of this week we'll have been a year a kick and it's been a fabulous team yeah. very small they're all doing other stuff normally yeah. Of you course. know yeah. and and some of them do sadly also have eds or hd yeah. and some are also neurodivergent some not um and some don't have any of it at all and still help which is yeah. amazing i really like it and the, yeah. and the value of it but what amazing. i find the more and more i talk to people it's like oh i know someone with that i know someone with that and you you yeah. sort of raise, yeah absolutely amazing so just moving, obviously I'm, as you know, a movement therapist, so I can't do a podcast without talking about movement. So, um, and obviously I came down to see you and your group, and I think it was a joint group with EDS UK and, and SEDS, and we talked about exercise and movement, and we had a lovely afternoon down in, uh, down in Sussex. Um, do, and, and not just exercise, we can talk about any kind of self-care, what do you do for your self-care whether it's exercise or, or whatever meditation whatever it might be or very not. good um, <laughs> yeah uh, um i like I, I i'm forcing myself to go out for walks when good. i can. um and i have to do physio yeah um and I do Pilates because you recommended some people and and we we started the online Pilates group, but it's um just a really, really small group. And it was amazing because these people had no confidence to do it before. Good. Um Good. so that that's been and it's great because it was the first then the the um I don't know if I should say their name or not. Um their group had never done it before. So they we sort of found our way how to work it out it, it quite a lot of admin and and real confidence from and trust from the members to do it because some of them yeah. have never tried it before and we get amazing um reports back which is lovely um and yes i do <laughs> i do remember you coming down and you were fabulous because as usual the tech had gone wrong <laughs> that's right thank goodness we had you had a a lovely gentleman who was there who was actually working in the tech who was a techie person and he saved the day because he had the right adapter <laughs> i think i think my youngest appeared actually with a wire or two was it him ah, um i thought it was a guy who was there there was another was, one as well yeah, but somebody um, somebody had the right cable because i'm not very technical and um thank goodness I, yeah we were saved we were saved I think I asked my youngest because he works. Yes, in I remember. Yeah. Um, yes. um, and then there was someone else. And I always find there's someone who can help usually. Yeah. You know, yes, I yes. don't get too flustered because it happens for years. <laughs> I've never had one event, I don't think, when it goes no, wrong. Exactly. Um, but that was, but it was really interesting. I still remember your your point about breathing and and the core and and that struck for me because I hadn't heard that before and I thought oh that's that's that would work yeah. that would yeah. work um yeah. and yeah. so um I think self-care um just being aware 
that you are a body and you have to move it and you have to feed it and make it drink <laughs> things like that yeah. um because i can definitely over focus on things that are, are enjoyable um uh, I, I would like a reformer. I never got around to getting one. Ah, uh, that would have been nice. Um, but I think you would have need you need sort of special help to use it. I'm not sure you'd know more th about that. Um, well, I lots think of, lots of people have them at home, but yeah, you probably you want some instruction on what to do with it first. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's really important. I have a lot of issues. Uh, I have to wear special boots and things. And we couldn't get it during COVID. So self-care for me was quite difficult in mm. some respects because you couldn't walk. It wasn't yeah. safe or yes. um, other things going on, like repeated tears of soft tissue. Um, but other people had it much worse. So I think it's, you know, I'm always thinking of things that would enlighten our lives um and yeah. there's so there are lots of thing plans going on i've got a really interesting one i just haven't heard so i can't say any more at the moment <laughs> but i think it would be really interesting to do and and fun yeah which is quite like yes. um well it should be fun right because if we're not enjoying what we're doing you're not going to stick to it like you said motivation you've got to be motivated and if it's like I've been told to exercise or I've been told to walk by my doctor and I hate it, you're probably not going to stick to it. You know, it's just human nature, right? So motivation. I was told, I was told if you stick to a habit for three weeks, it mm. is a habit. I don't know. That's that. right. Yeah, no. something like that. Yeah, I can't, I'm terrible at remembering numbers, but yeah, it is. If you do it for a certain number of days, it becomes a habit. So three weeks sounds about right. I think what's really important though is so many people, and I know I felt like that, are used to lockdown now or not going out. Well, for me, anyway, it became a bit like that. It was a bit strange going out. So yes. I imagine, I think I really empathise with the people I hadn't been out for years before because of illness, which I couldn't quite get my head around, to be honest. But yeah. I do now because it's just so so scary in a way isn't it it's, it's like I'm not used to being out I'm so used to being in all day yeah um, but there's a beauty I like um I like forests I like the smell mm. I like yeah. the sea um yeah. and I like going to pubs and sitting outside with friends uh, when it's not cold which I can't yeah. do it cold. yes um I can't do yeah. a lot of sports now I like music mm. an awful lot but don't know what to do about that really um mm. you mean not going to concerts you don't want to go out and or, or performing mm. uh, i quite like doing that um yes and but i have learned to understand myself and take um so i do go for walk as so many times my eldest has had to uh, recover me because i can't get home if I can walk because I get hyperglycemic and I forget to take um, something mm. with me. So now I do take these emergency yeah. packs and stuff. Yes. Otherwise I'm like a, a yeah. flop down somewhere. Um, yes. And, yeah, and yeah. I, I make that plan in the morning and I eat. I really eat a lot uh, regularly, which I, I didn't do before. Um, might be quite similar food, but it's quite... <laughs> um yeah so i i suppose that's the the sort of self-care i do and um it's as much as i can do at the moment yeah hopefully that sounds perfect up. sounds perfect oh well thank you thank you so much for sharing all your experiences with us um really varied and um diverse really fascinating so any of our listeners who would like to know more about your groups or what you, where, they, where can they get? I know you're obviously on Twitter um, at JG Jane Green or at SEDS HSD. So those are the two Twitter handles if you're interested in following um, Jane. And she tweets a lot. So she's always giving lots Am of Oh, yeah, I think so. I'm always getting lots of useful information from you. Oh. So she's a good one to follow if you want to go and have a look at her Twitter, if you're on Twitter. Um, and then you have a website, don't you? Um, it's www.sussex, 
eds.com. That's right, isn't it? Sussexeds.com. Um, and you've got another one here, um, the Autism Connected. What's yeah, that? I started another group. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Well, yeah, we've been going a year um, for or because when I was diagnosed at the age of fifty-four. Um, I was just said, you know, there's support groups around here and they were like for parents of young children. Mm. And that was it. So um, I decided to um, get a grassroots one going, ah. which is the idea is not like said so much. It's more the idea is meant to be more of a cooperative um, running it and we'll see where it goes. But we want a voice. Mm. And um, it's for women, those who identify as women or non-binary, because yes. of it, there are enough other groups of other types out there. And not yeah. just autism, um, neurodivergence. And we also have ooh, Instagram, which I never do, um, but I've got team members doing that. And um, the Facebook page, which anyone can um, follow the yeah. sense page. And the website will be growing. Um, considering it was it's very homegrown I had to learn to do it um, <laughs> oh well done gosh uh we we will be growing it um soon so there'll be news on that so more okay. people can sort of join up um yeah. we're still very local it's about the local funds um my my ethos is really about connecting and joining up because I think that way um changes are made as I said transformational change um and i really believe in um joining up and making things better for us and absolutely that is what i work with so i'm happy to connect to anyone that wants to work constructively and hope absolutely hope things change soon or the next few years anyway well yeah absolutely that's a really good point i mean it's the only way forward isn't it really you can't people can't do things on their own um so, yeah, reaching out to like minded people, creating groups like you're creating. Um, it's the way forward, I think. So, you know, and you're a real pioneer in that. You see you see a need and you you set something up. So fantastic. But you're hopefully really other people will be able to carry it on. Yeah. So absolutely. it won't just be me. That That's absolutely. the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, that's Absolutely. Cool. We all need, we need teams, don't we? We need, or, or communities that join together and support each other. And absolutely, it, it never comes down to just one person. I, I totally agree. Oh, lovely, Jane. Thank you so much for your time and um, answering all our questions. Um, so thank you to the listeners as well. I hope you enjoyed um, hearing from Jane. And, and as I say, we've given you her um contact details if you'd like to reach out and learn more about what um, Jane is doing um, for the sort of EDS community and the autism community. Um, so thank you again for watching. Thank you to our guest, Jane. And until next time, keep moving. <laughs>